how good it is, Lord Jesus, to be loved by you. Really a staggering thing that we who have by nature rebelled against you. All the vile thoughts, all the wayward deeds, lifetimes of failing to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, failures to love others as you would have us love, and you would embrace us, certainly not because of anything that we could have done, but only by your grace you loved the unlovely and are preparing us for an eternal home. How gracious of you, Lord Christ, to have conquered the grave, risen to the right hand of your Father, and make intercession for all those who are yours. So that whatever we face in this life, whatever uncertainties, whatever tumults, whatever hardships, nothing is a mystery to you. Nothing is a surprise to you. You, in fact, bring all things under your lordship to serve the good of your people. And we praise you for that. We rest in that. We pray tonight that you would give us rest in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, that we would see what you have for us there, that it might rightly guide the way we think about our time on earth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're finding your seat, I would love for you to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8. Last time when we were in the book of Daniel, we looked at the ram and goat vision. And this evening, we're going to look at the interpretation of the ram and goat vision. Uh, this, we'll look at the second half of Daniel chapter 8, beginning in verse 15. I want to warn you uh, this evening that this will be a rather lengthy introduction. In fact, two introductions are in store. Uh, I want us to see up front how we benefit from the details of a prophecy whose fulfillment has already come and gone. And I want us to understand our connection to Daniel chapter 8. That will be a first introduction. Second introduction, I want us to understand why Daniel 8 existed for Babylonian exiles. What did they need to know? How did they need to live on the basis of Daniel chapter 8? So these two introductions, I hope, will serve to set the table for our understanding of this chapter. I'm drawn particularly to a phrase in verse 12. Put your eyes on Daniel 8, 12. And we have here the account of a Greek ruler of the Seleucid dynasty named Antiochus Epiphanes. And it is said of him that he will fling truth to the ground. He will do whatever he wants and he will succeed. That statement has caught my attention this week, first of all, because reading the Hebrew text, every use of the word truth stands out. It is the word emet. So I just, oh, emet, there you are again, buddy, it's truth. So I notice it, and here, emet is flung to the ground. Sounds like a great dad wrestling move. And here, it depicts the darkest period of Israel's history up to this point. And it resonated with me this week in particular, as we think about the last week, the last few months, the last couple of years, I believe we've seen an acceleration of truth suppression in our culture. And we might wonder, has truth been flung to the ground in our own day? How does this happen? And we know by Jesus' words in John 3, 19 to 21, that men love darkness rather than light, and they're motivated to love darkness rather than light, which is really silly. They're motivated because their deeds are evil. Light exposes evil deeds. So they run from light, run from truth. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that men suppress the truth in unrighteousness, and one of the results of that is they claim to be wise and show themselves to be utter fools. You may know the name Richard Levine. Richard now goes by the name Rachel. Born in 1957, he was an American pediatrician. He is now a four-star admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commissioned Corps. I didn't know we had such a thing. 
and he has been the United States Assistant Secretary for Health since March of 2021. And you may know that Richard goes by the name Rachel because he has transitioned. He acts, dresses, and pretends to be a woman. William Thomas uh, is a swimmer for the University of Pennsylvania, a man who has decided he wants to be a woman, and he's defeating female athletes, including Olympic medalists, in competitive swimming, and goes by the name Leah. This week, our nation's latest nominee to the Supreme Court was asked a very simple question. You may have heard it. What is a woman? And this is a question that everybody knows the answer to. Everybody has known the answer to ever since there have been humans on the earth. Katanji Brown Jackson claimed that she was unable to answer the question because, quote, I am not a biologist. Now, there are two significant ironies of an answer like that to a very answerable question. The first of which is she was selected to be a nominee to the Supreme Court precisely because she is a woman. And the second irony her answer reveals is she knows biologists can answer the question. She knows it is a biological question, a matter of XX or XY chromosomes. It, it has an objective truth answer that everybody knows. It's not a difficult question. The differences between men and women are biological, and they're defined objectively by chromosomal realities, and they are manifested physically and functionally. And these differences have been known as truth by all humans of all time in all places since humanity began until something like a few minutes ago. And, and these ideas are not just silly things that can be dismissed as harmless little whimsical fantasies. The promotion of these kinds of lies, of this trampling of truth, has many victims. And you could probably list a few. Some poor NCAA athletes, female athletes. You might list feminists as ironic victims. Even gay rights advocates groups are running into problems. If, if you can't define what a man or a woman is, you have a hard time dealing with same gender attraction rights. And then, of course, it creates problems for law and jurisprudence. How can you decide that a woman's rights have been violated if you don't know what a woman is? And more tragically, the effect on teens in our day, in their formative years, facing body confidence issues, abdication of parental involvement, hormonal changes, the bombardment of sexualized entertainment, and the tempering effect of normal social interaction... In other words, you, normally teens go out and hang out with other teens in real life. That has been removed and replaced by online interaction. It has been totally demolished by the black hole of the internet. And so a lonely, confused teen can find an army of anonymous peers, confidants, and sympathy, phony sympathy, avatar sympathy, with a few simple clicks on a laptop or a phone, and, and, and as such a teen can scroll and scroll, finding affirmations for their confusion from unknown people who many times have a vested interest in the destruction of the lonely teen. I listened to a tragic interview of such a teenage girl just this week who had transitioned to a boy and then transitioned back. And then to hear her describe the ease with which radical adjustments were made just to help her live out a lie. Sickening. And we'll probably never know the true cost of such a trampling of obvious truth. And the critical victim in all of this, the one that affects all of us every day, is the flinging of the truth to the ground that hurts everyone, is truth itself. Truth is the victim. I would suggest to you this evening that there are several parties in league together to promote a lie that everyone involved knows is a lie. I'll give you three categories here. There are the morally perverse, there are the totalitarians, and there is the general populace. The morally perverse are those who are attracted to a lie because they want to live under a lie as cover. 
The totalitarians are those who crave power. They are controllers. They, they themselves know better how everyone else should run their lives. Uh, that could be the state or media or celebrities or industries. And then there's the general population who just wants to get along. They want to be nice and tolerant. They find out soon that that nice tolerance turns into virtue signaling and then judgmentalism and radical intolerance. And if you think about these three parties, the morally perverse, the totalitarians, and the general population, they are in something of a triangle where everyone gets something out of the deal in the agreement together that what we all know to be a lie is suddenly somehow true. This is an unholy alliance against truth where each of these three parties is motivated by what they get from the others. Here's what I mean. The morally perverse get moral cover and a placated conscience. They get legal protection from the state, if we all say this is a lie, and image protection from popular media. They get moral acceptance from the general population. Romans 1.32 says, Although people know that these things are wrong before God, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Why do they approve? It's not just the gender fluid who seek to get moral cover from this lie. It is all of those who twist or pervert God's standards for gender and sexuality. My deviant behavior can be mainstreamed, normalized, made acceptable in polite society if really deviant behavior starts to get traction. It's talked about, promoted, defended, and normalized. If it seems like everyone is doing it and and many are perverting norms far more than me, then my own conscience can quiet down. I can't be judged by others and my inherently shameful behavior can no longer incur shame. So the morally perverse get off the hook. The totalitarians get things out of this deal. Uh, Government statists or even non-government powerful elites, social media tech giants, etc. They get to control. They will promote as commendable what they know is a lie because the disruption of basic societal structures provides opportunity for them to step in as the solution. If the family breaks down, if people can't operate normally, if there's no longer a sense of right and wrong, soon we'll have anarchy unless somebody with the answers, with power, steps in. And those who, for some reason, love to control others, love that opportunity. This was Marx's recipe employed by Stalin and his disciples. This was the fundamental premise of the Chinese Communist Revolution. I just read a book on Saddam Hussein and his tyranny in Iraq. When Saddam Hussein came to power, 80% of Iraqi people were illiterate. He decided, we're going to bring everybody in Iraq up to the 20th century and we'll teach them all to read, which means we're going to give them everything we want them to read. We're going to control the information. So now kids in schools hear what the state wants to tell them, And it's different than mom and dad. They've got to break down the family structure. Uh, Saddam Hussein knew he even had to break the relationship between Arabs and their imams in Islam. I've got to break religion too. Because the state has to be more important than the family and the religion. How do I do that? Teach all the kids to read. In the schools, the kids get re-educated. And they were told in their schools in Iraq, your parents are a little backwards. That's okay. They just don't know. You need to love them and honor them. And you're a mom at the local, uh, uh, what's an Islamic place called? The mosque. You're a mom at the mosque. He's a little backwards too. He's just not up to date. Honor him. By the way, um, what's your dad's name and what's your address? And then dad would disappear from the home for two or three weeks, come back bruised with a big smile on his face saying, Saddam Hussein is the greatest. And he would never again speak against the state at home. All of a sudden, the children were the informants for those in power against the families, against basic societal structures, against friendships. It was said in Iraq during that time that only 8 to 10% of the adult population were informants to the state, were party members. But that's all you need. If one out of a ten can tell on you, I'm not going to say something bad about Saddam Hussein in public. I'll get hauled off. And they hung people in public squares for speaking against dear leader. So the controllers want people to believe what they know is a lie 
Because if I can get you to no longer speak the truth, in fact, embrace what you know is a lie, if I can control you at that level, at the mind level, at the heart level, in your home, in the privacy of your own thoughts, I can control anything. There is a vested interest for totalitarians to go along with what they know is a lie because they get to be the solution and they get to control people. Then there is the general population. The general population goes along with what they know is a lie because they want to be seen as nice and tolerant and loving. Really, what they want to be able to say is, I'm a good person because I don't judge. I'm tolerant. I'm, I, I'm nice. Very quickly, that definition of I'm a good person because I tolerate the charade becomes I promote the charade and then I demand that everyone else embrace the charade. So now the definition of nice, now the definition of love, the definition of morality is to tell each other that we believe what we all know to not be true. The emperor has the most magnificent clothes while he's standing in front of all of us in his underwear. And the populace becomes an army now of moralistic crusaders whose cause is a lie that everyone knows is a lie. What does the population get out of the deal? They got to be called good people without ever actually doing anything good. So truth is thrown to the ground. And everybody thinks they're getting a good deal. The reality is when you make truth your enemy, you lose. Everyone loses. When a society makes itself an enemy of truth, it cannot last. So what will the people of God do when truth is flung to the ground? Add to the battle for truth in our day the increasing fragmentation of our society and the polarization around every single issue. Add to that the power brokers in government and industry vying for control of populations we are facing a severe curtailing of individual liberty in ways that we know and don't know, both political liberty and religious liberty. Add to the loss of liberty the uncertainty of global conflict and the threat of World War III. Add to that the increasing taxation, supply chain problems, economic stagnation, monetary inflation, runaway national debt, the fact that 35% of all dollars ever printed were printed by the Federal Reserve in 2020. And all of this is producing economic uncertainty and rampant anxiety. What will the people of God do when liberties are strangled? When obedience to God's word is not tolerated? When a comfortable way of life evaporates? When supply chain disruption and financial unpredictability ruin everyone's plans? When tyrants overturn governments and overrun nations, upending the stability of life for masses of people? When the world around us is perplexed? displaced, deceived, all the while enslaved by its various lusts. What will the people of God do? I think this is why we need Daniel 8. That's introduction number one. To help us understand the plight of God's people in Daniel 8, it's going to help us think clearly about implications from Daniel 8 for us today. Okay, now introduction number two. Daniel chapter 8 culminates in the terrible rule of Antiochus Epiphanes. The darkest days of Israel's history up to that point, unprecedented, horrific period of their history. He is the little horn of verses 9 to 14 and 23 to 26. He is the horrifying focal point of this chapter. After the return from Babylonian exile, the nation of Israel will be subservient to a sequence of Gentile nations under varying degrees of religious and political oppression. But under Antiochus Epiphanes, Yahweh's people would endure unspeakable subjugation and persecution. In fact, he would make punishable by death the worship of Yahweh. This period of history is detailed in 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Those are two non-Bible books. They are apocryphal. They happen between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're during the silent years. And they have some fanciful things and some wrong theological ideas, but they are really good on-site historical um, documents. So they're really helpful for us in this history. There are others, uh, contemporary and later, who wrote from this time, and this is where we get much of our information. 
Antiochus III, that's not the Antiochus in view here in Daniel chapter 8. Antiochus III, um, it was 198 BC when he defeated Egypt. Palestine, before that, was part of Egyptian rule under the Ptolemies. And at the time of Antiochus III, when he defeated, defeated Egypt, he brought Israel under Seleucid rule. That is, those, uh, we'll talk about them in a minute, the, the generals from Alexander the Great who took over four regions of the former Greek Empire. And Antiochus III gave Jews religious freedom. In fact, for a period of three years, he declared no taxes for Jews. They didn't have to pay any taxes to the government that was over them. He decreased future taxation for all Jews by one-third, and he said no priests and no servants of the temple have to pay any taxes ever at all. These were good days for Jews in Jerusalem. Even if they didn't have national sovereignty, under the Ptolemies in Egypt, they were under severe hardship. Now, under Antiochus III, Seleucid rule, they had tremendous religious freedom. It was about at the same time that the Samaritan division from the Jews in Judea and Jerusalem uh, happened. They set up their own center of worship on Mount Gerizim. You remember in 587 BC, Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple. It was rebuilt under Cyrus. And then the Judeans, those from Jerusalem and the surrounding region, mostly from the tribe of Judah, they didn't want the other tribes, the separated tribes, the northern tribes, to have anything to do with the rebuild under Cyrus. They actually excluded them from the rebuild. They said, nope, that's just us. And so those tribes of Israel outside of Judea uh, built their own temple, their own center of worship at Mount Gerizim. They became the Samaritans. Antiochus III was beaten by the Romans in 190 BC at the Battle of Magnesia. He died three, days, or three years later in 187. This began the serious decline of the Greek Empire, particularly the Seleucid dynasty. We'll talk about them in a minute. They show up in Daniel chapter 8. Antiochus III was humiliated in defeat, and as a result, the Greeks had to pay heavy tribute to Rome from then on. Rome was the rising power on the scene, and while they didn't control all the land they eventually would under the Roman Empire, they did have a superior army and forced others to pay tribute. Antiochus III's son was Seleucus IV, and he became king. But his brother... Antiochus IV, he's the subject of Daniel 8. This is where all this is going. He was held as a hostage in Rome for 12 years. And while there, he learned Roman ways and Roman power and Roman might and, and Roman military strategy. And Seleucus, his brother, traded Seleucus' own son to get his brother back from Roman slavery, to free Antiochus IV from Rome. So Antiochus IV came back, Seleucus himself was murdered in 175 BC, and Antiochus IV seized power. He wasn't the rightful heir, but he took over. So now he is the new Seleucid king, and he took the name Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes means the manifest one, or even the one who manifests God. And he ruled from 175 to 163 B.C. Antiochus Epiphanes could not fight Rome in a straight battle, but he warred with the Ptolemies. Those are the ones that had controlled Egypt and at one point controlled Jerusalem. He was paying heavy tribute to Rome, and he was paying for endless costly wars. It meant that the Seleucid dynasty began a campaign of looting the wealth of all their subject peoples. How do we get money to pay for these expensive wars and pay all our tribute to Rome? So he turned on Jerusalem and began looting the city. This brought significant unrest. There were different parties of Jews in Judea at the time. There were the Hellenized, that is the Greekified Jews. They imbibed Greek culture. They significantly compromised on obedience to Torah to be like the world around them. Uh, around them. They brought in Greek philosophy and culture and athletics. Uh, they even requested a gymnasium built. Uh, gymnasium is a, a, a place where sporting events unclothed are held. And then there were the, in addition to the Hellenized, the Greekified Jews, there were those faithful to Torah. They wanted to seek to live according to God's word. 
You also had the nationalists who wanted personal liberty and political national sovereignty. And you also had the sellouts. They were in league with the Seleucid rulers for political position, for power, for money. And you had a bunch of people in between. There was infighting between these perspectives, unrest toward Antiochus' government. In 170 BC, Antiochus had the high priest, Onias III, murdered. He was a priest that was legitimately in the priestly line. He was a Torah-following priest. And after he was murdered, all temple priests in Jerusalem were either picked by the pagan rulers or approved by them, and most of them were not even in the Levitical or Aaronic line. That is, they would have been illegal under God's law. In 169 BC, Antiochus was in Egypt. He's still trying to take over more territory, but he was stopped there by a Roman commander and Roman soldiers. And the Roman soldiers encircled Antiochus, drew a line in the sand, and the commander said, you can come out of that circle alive when you give up Egypt. And all the armed Roman soldiers are standing around him. And he has no choice. If he says he wants to hold on to Egypt, they're going to kill him on the spot. If he walks out of that circle, he gives up any attempt to rule Egypt. And so he's totally subservient to Rome. Uh, he can't go get uh, money and power from the Egyptians and the Ptolemies anymore. He has to keep paying Roman tribute, and he is totally embarrassed. And so he turned his eyes toward what Daniel calls the beautiful land, Judea and Jerusalem. Uh, not beautiful necessarily because of its topography or its uh, anything going on there in terms of beauty, but simply because of God's affections and his covenant promises for what he said he would do for the people there and for the land. And there are several reasons he turned his attention on Judea and Jerusalem. Geographically, militarily, it's important. It's the land between Rome and Egypt. If Rome wants to conquer Egypt, they've got to go through Israel. Israel just happens to be the poor piece of property right between empires and continents. And so the empires traipsed back and forth through it. Secondly, he needed money. He was an angry tyrant. He couldn't control Egypt, couldn't beat Rome. He would not inherit the greatness of the empires that came before him. What can he control? Who can he beat up on? The Jews. And so he ransacked the temple and took all of its valuables. He began a concerted persecution of the Jewish people. He sent his chief tax official to burn down the city of Jerusalem, level its walls, destroy its inhabitants, and take all its valuables. And in that campaign, 80,000 men, women, children, and infants were murdered by his soldiers. Women and children were also taken as slaves. The city walls were torn down, and a fort, a garrison, was set up in the city. Antiochus himself even entered the holy place in the temple. And so the Jews had another name for him, not Antiochus Epiphanes, but Antiochus Epimenes, or Madman. Antiochus then instigated new laws designed to eliminate the worship of Yahweh altogether. He decreed there would be no religious observances. There would be no sacrifices. There would be no Sabbath observance. No circumcision. All the holy books had to be destroyed. And all of this was punishable by death. If they found out that you had a son that was circumcised, they would kill him and you. There was a new religion in town instituted by Antiochus Epiphanes. It was the worship of Zeus or Jupiter. Both at Jerusalem and at Gerizim, the temples there were uh, filled with worship to Zeus. Statues of Zeus were there and Zeus worship was required of everyone in town. Greek soldiers and their lovers performed immoral acts in the temples. Drunken orgies were required of everybody as worship. In December of 167 BC, the altar of Zeus set up in the temple. Antiochus Epiphanes slaughtered pigs on the altar. And altars for this new religion were set up in every town in Judea. And perhaps he thought he could get the Jews to switch religions under the threat of death. You read one account of a mother who encouraged her eight children to be faithful to Yahweh while Antiochus' soldiers butchered them one by one before her. Faithful Jews would not yield. Eventually, an insurrection broke out, guerrilla warfare, and eventually, 166 BC, led by a man named Judas Maccabeus. Maccabeus means the hammer. In 163 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes was dead, 
And in 164 BC, Judas the hammer in December cleaned out the temple, destroyed the altars to Zeus. The temple was purified and rededicated to Yahweh worship and an eight day festival at the purification and rededication of the temple was instituted. Hanukkah, the festival of lights. These have been dark days for the nation. Unprecedented difficulty they had not yet faced. After 164, the Jews in Judea had religious freedom, but not political freedom. Tribalistic factions that emerged during this time continued through the rest of Jewish history in the land of Israel all the way through the New Testament era. You heard John this morning talking about 5,000 men gathered in hope that this miracle-working Jesus would be the Messiah who would lead a final insurrection against Rome. The seeds of this go back to this time of oppression. Nationalists and zealots and those who hope for political freedom in addition to individual and religious freedom. All of this brought out variations of responses in Jerusalem and in the cities and towns of Judea. There were the Hasidim, the righteous ones, those who loved the Torah. They loved God's law and they were willing to die in order to be faithful to it. And then you have what Daniel calls in Daniel 8.23, the transgressors. That is most likely a reference to Judean leaders who had lined their pockets and secured their own power by being in league with pagan idolatry and foreign leaders. It also would have included Jews who had no care for God's law. And in a land of corruption and compromised spiritual leadership, they saw the opportunity to live however they wanted. There were in this mix also the freedom fighters who did not like political oppression, so they took up arms and instigated guerrilla warfare. And when religious freedom was once again instituted, that wasn't enough for them. They wanted more. They wanted a revolution Then there were the compromisers, those who rolled over on biblical conviction, Jews who followed God's law while everyone else did, but when the tide changed, they drifted with it. When Antiochus Epiphanes set up pagan altars in every town in Judea, they offered pagan sacrifices in order to survive, maybe survive till the next administration. Why would a mother choose to watch her eight children butchered by Syrian soldiers in front of her if she could avoid it? This was a population without conviction who just tried to get along. That is introduction number two. What would the people of God do when liberties are strangled? When obedience to God's word is not tolerated? When a comfortable way of life evaporates? When a supply chain disruption and financial unpredictability ruin everyone's plans? When tyrants overturn governments and overrun nations? upending stability of life for masses of people. When the world around them is perplexed, displaced, deceived, all the while enslaved by various lusts. Why is Daniel 8 in the Bible? Because the people of Israel in Babylonian exile would need to be prepared in heart for what is to come. The theme of the book of Daniel is that God is meticulously sovereign over all of the details of life. And he is orchestrating history after his own glorious causes, and he will institute his Messiah and establish him on the earth as the rightful king. That day is coming. But until then, life on earth is hard. We need to entrust ourselves to him. Faith in him and cultivating faithfulness in response, until he comes. So here's Daniel 8. Daniel receives the interpretation of the ram goat vision. I'll put the entire outline for you up there. Uh, We're going to look at the heavenly intention, the ram, which is the Medo-Persian Empire, the goat's great horn, which is Alexander the Great, the goat's four horns, which is Alexander's four generals, the goat's little horn, which is Antiochus Epiphanes, the heavenly directive, which is the command, preserve this vision, and then the prophet's response, Daniel was troubled. Uh, We'll probably get through the first four this evening. Daniel received this vision. Look up at Daniel 8, chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me. 
It was after the one he had received before, that is, after the vision he got of chapter 7. Chapter 7 deals with the end of the world. This deals with the end of the indignation. Different period of time, different horizon. This again was about the time that Cyrus was establishing the Medo-Persian Empire and the world was watching. They were troubled. What's going to happen next? Is there going to be war? More captivities? Displacements? What's going to happen? And Daniel is transported, visionarily transported to Susa, 220 miles east of Babylon. That is modern day Iran. That would eventually be the, the major city and the capital of the Persian Empire at the time that this was written. It wasn't a big town at all. It, it, you could hardly find it on a map. So even Daniel's mention of this as being transported there by God is a forward-looking prophecy that actually came true in real history. Again, giving us confidence in the truth of Daniel's future prophetic visions. We see, first of all, beginning in verse 15, the heavenly intention. Read this with me, verses 15 to 19. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now, while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand upright. He said, behold, I am going to let you know what will occur at the final period of this indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Verse 15, Daniel wanted to understand. He sought to know the interpretation of the vision. And he saw one standing resembling a man, one who looked like a man. This is not a man, but one who looks like a man. In verse 16, we find this one literally be between the banks of the Ulai River or the Ulai Canal. What does it mean to be between the banks? He's somewhere in the river. I, I get the impression here that he is hovering over the middle of the river. And he speaks. He orders Gabriel, an angel, one of only two named in the Bible, to give Daniel the interpretation. In verse 17, Daniel is frightened and falls on his face. And in verse 18, we see Daniel in a deep sleep. He's not tired. He has swooned from fright. Uh, the same word is used of Jonah in Jonah 1.5 in the midst of a raging storm. It's also used of Adam in Genesis 2.21 when God puts Adam to sleep and makes his wife. I believe that Daniel is frightened here because God is present. This one who is described as like a man seems to be set apart different from the angels and he's giving the angels command, specifically the command to mediate the word of God and in the interpretation of the vision to God's prophet. If this is in fact the presence of God, I think we have every reason to think this is the pre-incarnate Christ. It was so in Isaiah 6.5 when Isaiah fell down as a dead man before him. It was so for the apostle John in Revelation chapter 1 when John fell down before the risen and glorified Christ. In verse 19, we discover this is uh, pertaining to the final period of indignation, pertaining to the appointed time of the end. This is a, a near view with the near horizon of the end of the vision that's described here. That is the Medo-Persian and the Greek empires. It doesn't go to Rome and it doesn't go to second iteration of Rome. It's different than the vision given in chapter 7 about the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist that we've looked at already. We'll see him again in Daniel. This is a different vision with a different terminus. But notice in all of this that God wants Daniel and us to know the vision and its interpretation. How do we know God wanted Daniel to know it? Because God gave it to Daniel. How do we know that God wants us to know it? Because Daniel is a writing prophet. He's not merely a speaking prophet, hearing direct revelation and then giving God's word to his people. No, Daniel here is a writing prophet and God is inscripturating this vision and its interpretation for us. And he's commissioned an angel to give the heavenly interpretation to him. And in verse 26 of Daniel chapter 8, we read this command to Daniel, seal it up. The New American Standard unhelpfully says, keep the vision secret. Uh, that's not the idea at all. It literally is seal it up. That is, preserve it. It's going to be needful. It's going to be needed. God's people at the appropriate time are going to need these words. So seal it up, preserve it. 
They keep it in readiness for God's Word to be applied. From time to time, I sneak into hiding places to scare my kids. I'm not suggesting that's a good parenting tactic. But I kind of like it. And, and Zoe has an interesting response to being surprised and frightened. Her response is a karate chop. And I have been a victim of such things on numerous occasions. And it is a startling response, not for her, but for the rest of us. Sneak up on Zoe and scare her. Watch out. Don't be in range. She will karate chop you. But if I were to, in Zoe's sight, sneak around the corner so that she sees me getting there, and when she comes around the corner, I say, boo, there's no karate. Daniel chapter 8 exists so that God's people will not freak out at what is coming. And it is coming. But if they know, if God has told them, there is a very practical application for understanding the reason they need to be aware of all the empires, all the dynasties, all the bad guys that are going to traipse through the Holy Land, oppress God's people, persecute, and they need to be faithful. They need to be faithful so that they don't karate chop the goodness of God in their hearts when it happens. All right, the ram, number two in your outline, is the Medo-Persian Empire. Verse 20, Daniel 8, verse 20. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents, here it is, the kings of Media and Persia. No mystery. Daniel just told us, here's what it is. That empire didn't exist when this happened. It didn't exist, uh, it wasn't in power when Daniel got the vision. And yet, clearly, the divine interpretation, you want to know what the ram is? It's Media and Persia. Uh, how was the ram described back in verses 3 and 4? Look back there real quick. I lifted my eyes and looked. Behold, a ram. It had two horns standing in front of the canal. The two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, and the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram butting westward, northward, southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and magnified himself. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Here is this invincible beast. Strangely, with lopsided horns. What is that about? Well, Daniel tells us this is the Medo-Persian Empire. And it's appropriate, very fitting, a perfect depiction. The Persians became more powerful in the Medo-Persian Empire over time, and they grew in their power after the Medes were powerful. In fact, after Cyrus came to power, uh, Cyrus the Persian, uh, the, Persian, the Persian side of the Medo-Persian Empire became stronger. And they moved west, now north and south. West, they conquered Babylon and Syria and what is now Turkey. In the north, they captured Armenia and the Caspian Sea region. In the south, they covered Egypt and Ethiopia. They did, in fact, become great and controlled more territory than any nations before it. Now, verse 4 of Daniel chapter 8 covers about 200 years of history in a brief mention. This vision is speeding us towards something more horrifying than a ram with two lopsided horns. And we get through 200 years of empire history really quick. Can you imagine being one of the exiles from Babylon returning to Judea and thinking, all this bad stuff's going to happen. And one empire's going to rule, and then a whole other empire is going to smash that one. And then there's another thing, and this other thing, and this other thing. When will it ever end? How long, O Lord? And we'll get to that refrain in this chapter. The rest of the vision in Daniel chapter 8 pertains to the goat that is Greece. So number three in your outline, the goat's great horn. The goat's great horn is Alexander the Great. I don't know if uh, Daniel called him the great or his mom called him the great, but it's the same. He, here's this great horn from the goat. Look at verse 21. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. What's interesting, goats normally don't have one horn coming between the eyes. This is a singular ruler, a spectacular ruler with singular power who is very great. He came from the west. Look at verses 5 to 8, the description of this goat. Behold, the male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal. 
and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram. He was enraged at him. He struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. As soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. That is the history of Alexander the Great. We get the very clear interpretation of the vision. This is Greece, and this is its first king. What do we know about Alexander the Great? In blitzkrieg speed, i.e. without touching the ground, in a very short period of time, he defeated army after army and accumulated most of the territory of the known world and the spoils of the previous empire. He was tutored by Aristotle. He was 20 years of age when he became king of Ionia, this little thing where Greece is, and then grew it into the Greek empire. 336 BC, he became king. And in less than two years, he defeated the Persians in battle and ended the Medo-Persian empire. The mighty wrath that Daniel describes was historically accurate description of the Greek resentment to the Persian Empire. The Persians had invaded and attacked Greece on a number of occasions, and they held a grudge. Alexander himself had a great grudge, had a bone to pick with the Persians, wanted to settle a historical score. Alexander the Great believed that Achilles, the great Greek warrior of the Trojan War, and the god Hercules were his direct ancestors. He eventually demanded to be worshipped as a god in all of his provinces. At the height of his power, he died, June 13, 323. He was 32 years old, sick, exhausted, and drunk at a party. That's the end of the great horn. Number four in your outline. The goat's four horns. These are Alexander's generals. Look at verse 22. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, though not with his power. Look back at the second half of verse 8 in the vision. As soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, Alexander the Great was broken, and in his place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. That is, the Grecian Empire was split between four smaller kingdoms in four directions. This is exactly what happened. Alexander's generals subdivided the Greek Empire after his death and became separate dynasties over four separate regions, and then their families ruled those dynasties. Cassander uh, ruled Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus was over Thrace, that is Bulgaria, Greece, and modern-day Turkey. And then Seleucus was over Syria and Mesopotamia. And then Ptolemy was over Egypt and Palestine. Again, Israel under Ptolemy rule, those guys from the Greek empire who were now ruling over Egypt, um, they were under that rule for about 100 years, 300 to 200 B.C., Again, until 198 B.C. when Antiochus III defeated Egypt. That takes us up to the goat's little horn and Antiochus Epiphanes. We're going to look at his political history in Israel next week, Lord willing. Before we go this evening, I want us to think a few, a few thoughts about the import for us in thinking about the details of a text like Daniel 8. Again, the immediate audience, the immediate purpose was to prepare the exiles and then subsequent generations of, of Jews for what was ahead. Nearing the end of Babylonian captivity, they would go back to the land, but turbulent politics would be in place. They would have restored temple worship. That's encouraging. There's a temple in our future, but no national sovereignty. They would be allowed to return to the land by Persia, but they would be persecuted by Greece and then dominated by Rome. That's what's coming, Israel. They needed to know that. They needed to be reminded, as one commentator has said, that superpowers are not really safe places. Mighty and powerful nations, in fact, are simultaneously furious and fragile. You're in trouble under the superpower, and you're in trouble when the superpower is gone too. There's a significant lesson for us in all of this, and lessons for the Jews in exile. There will be no strategy to circumvent the prophecy. In getting Daniel chapter 8, the, the Babylonian exiles could say, well, let's not go back to the land. Uh, let's buy some property in Tanzania. <laughs> and they could come up with some investment strategy to, to, to hedge against the Seleucid dynasty. 
Uh, no, there was nothing of that they could do. This was God's plan. The God of history is ordering these events. The, the, the right response, the application here is not, how do we undo the prophecy? And I fear that many people who look at biblical prophecy today are thinking, boy, how do we defeat the Antichrist? First, we've got to find out who he is. We've got to get behind his politics. We've got to vote that guy out. There's none of that. That is not the takeaway here. There's no strategy to outsmart the prophecy. There's a lesson here as well in thinking through the distinctions between religious conviction and political liberty. What will it look like to be a lover of God's law and faithful to Him? Would you die for that? Would you similarly foment a rebellion against government for personal rights, personal liberties. Those are two significantly different issues. There's a lesson here about what the task of the faithful is. Don't be surprised. Be prepared. The preparation is not an investment strategy or an armory or a political stratagem. The preparation is enduring faith and cultivated faithfulness under a long, difficult future history. It means to trust God, the sovereign author of history. It means to be forewarned so as to cling to God and His promises. Jesus did similar things for His disciples. Who would look forward to hardship? Mark 13, Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying, I'm he, and they'll mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things, listen to this, must take place. That's not yet the end. Nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, famines. These are merely the beginnings of birth pangs. Similarly, Jesus in Matthew 24 gave instructions to disciples, to followers of Christ who will be on the earth during the Great Tribulation, which will be a far darker time than the one we've just described under Antiochus Epiphanes. And he says to those future followers of him, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet, which tells us that hasn't yet happened, still in the future, when you see that one standing in the holy place, let the reader of Daniel 7 understand. <laughs> then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Don't go down and get your wallet. Hope it's not a Saturday. You know, all the instructions that come out of that. And Jesus gives specific instructions about future difficult times because he loves his people and he wants them to not freak out when the world goes haywire because... The world is haywire, and it will go haywire again and again and again and again until Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Till God establishes Messiah's reign on the earth, and the stone cut out without hands smashes all previous sinful human governments, and the right man, the God-man, reigns on the earth. That's our hope. That's what we look forward to. We look ahead to the kingdom of Messiah here on the earth. We'll talk next week about some more takeaways after we go through the dark history of Antiochus Epiphanes. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this chapter. Thank you that you had Daniel write it down, that you brought about an interpretation one that obviously affirms our confidence in the precision of your predictive prophecy, but also very practically warns us to cultivate faith in you, confidence in your sovereignty, rather than some flimsy hope in the tides that ebb and flow of political intrigue and rumors of wars. God, we love you. We are so thankful to be loved by you, to be rescued from the wrath that is to come and to have a citizenship with you. We've never yet been home, 
but we thank you that with you is our home. Come, Lord Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen.